Okay, good morning, everybody. Thanks for joining us. I'm Katie Earle. I'm the coordinator of our University Express program, and we're joined with Dr. John Harrigan. Welcome, John. Thank you. Great. We appreciate everyone being here. Quick housekeeping stuff, just so you know how to participate. We are recording the session. I'll try to post it on our website in the near future. If you have any questions for John as he goes through his presentation, feel free to type those in the Q&A panel and we'll get to the questions throughout and then at the end. So if you're on a computer, that Q&A panel is located at the lower right-hand side of your screen. Just click on it, expand it, send your questions to either one of us because he'll have it his up too. And then if you're on a tablet or smartphone, touch your screen. That brings up your control panel. You'll see a circle with three dots. Click on that and then you'll see your Q&A. So we'd like to thank our sponsors, which is our Department of Senior Services, Blue Cross Blue Shield of Western New York, Excelsior Orthopedics, and Wegmans for all their support. And if you ever need anything, Senior Services is 858-8526. All right, let's learn about our speaker. John Harrigan's career is spent balancing work in the social sciences, the cinematic arts, and education. As an educator, John chaired the Communication Arts Department of SUNY Erie for 15 years. He is the recipient of the State University of New York Chancellor's Award for Excellence in Teaching. Dr. Harrigan is a former faculty member of the Project Zero Summer Institute and the Graduate School of Education at Harvard University. He's also taught internationally, most recently as a visiting professor in Singapore, and he's here with us. Thank you, John. It's all yours. Oh, well, thank you, Katie. Appreciate that. So, uh, so what I want to do is I'm, I'm going to kind of walk you through a, a variety of photographs from around the world that I've taken. Uh, and as I show you some of these places around the world, I will offer some uh, tips and some strategies uh, about maybe about how I took that particular photograph or just general tips and strategies when you're traveling and how to take uh, more, more interesting photos or some unique photos as you um, travel around. Um, I will start by saying there are usually three, just to make it very simple and very general, there are usually three things that we look for when we are photographing when we're traveling. Um, places, okay, so people take lots of photos of places. So that's things like landscapes, buildings, cityscapes, architecture, things of that nature. The second thing are taking pictures of people, right? So people, it could be like street photography, people just on the street, it could be events, it could be people working, playing, um, cultural activities, things of that nature. And then uh, the last thing are taking pictures of things when you travel, like objects that you see, uh, unique things that you see when you're maybe on the street again, or maybe it's food or maybe something to do with nature. So those are the three general things that you want to think about when you're thinking, what should I take pictures of? Places, people, and, and things. Now, with that said, what you'll see today mostly are uh, places. So I, I do take pictures in all of those categories, but mainly this presentation is about uh, places and particularly mostly landscapes. I have some buildings, some architectural aspects as well, but mostly places that you'll see. And again, these are from um, all over the world. In, and what's also interesting, hopefully, about this presentation is it's different conditions. So you'll see that that can factor into your photography, the different lighting conditions, different environmental conditions, and so on. So I want just to kind of start with that little overview before we get into the actual places. Uh, and I will say, because people usually ask, this title page, uh, this is um, this picture you're looking at here is from Yosemite. Uh, I'm sure maybe some people uh, pre uh, present today have been to Yosemite National Park in California. This is up on uh, Glacier Point, which is one of the highest points you can get uh, in Yosemite, looking sort of down into the valley. And this is a shot that was done at dusk. So I opened up one of the things you can do on a camera is open up the aperture, which allows more light in. So if you're in darker conditions, if you if you can control that on your camera, you can open up the aperture, which allows more light in to expose the picture properly. Otherwise, it'd be too dark. So this is at dusk, but it looks a little brighter than that because I opened up the aperture. OK. Oh, and let me one other thing and Katie already mentioned this. Please uh, feel free to ask questions at any point. Uh, you know, I, I, I would you know, love to just answer maybe specific questions you have about your own experiences, your own, um, you know, questions about photography. OK, so let's go on to this picture here. Um, this is uh, so I lived as, as Katie mentioned, I lived in Singapore for some time as a visiting professor and Singapore is in Southeast Asia at the tip of the Malay Peninsula. It's about, um, it's, you know, it's 
10 minutes from Malaysia and about an hour from Indonesia, right uh, in a beautiful spot in the world, very tropical. Um, so, and it's also a very modern, a borderline futuristic city, as these, as this image illustrates. These are um, super grove trees. They call them super grove trees, and they're part vegetation and part electric. And I can use. I think, I think you can see my cursor here. Um, there are people walking. Uh, it's like a little um, <clears throat> a walkway that connects these trees. There's, there's about. You'll see. There's maybe four here, one, two, three, four trees here. There's about, this is one of the groves. There's probably about five groves with five or six trees in each grove. And they're connected, some of these, and you can walk up there so you can see how big and large these trees are. And again, this is a night shot. Um, this was, uh, you know, so I have to put the camera down on a tripod and expose it properly to get the right, you know, I'm sure you've taken a picture at night where it, looked, it looks blurry, it doesn't look, it looks underexposed or overexposed. So you kind of have to, it's a little more tricky at night to get the right, exposure so so yeah so i have se several from singapore to start because that's where i spent it was a base for a while when i was doing southeast asia stuff this is more from singapore uh, uh again these are all night shots i'm starting with some night shots to show you how to expose properly at night uh, this is the skyline at the front of the bay um, this is a buddhist temple i'll open this one up a little bit here you can see the light stream so you can ex you can expose to get the light stream. It's slightly it's I oh, I kept the ISO, which is the um, speed of the photography uh, high on this, so it's a little grainy. And then um, this is a just as a footnote, this is a very unique. It almost doesn't even look real. People tell me it doesn't even it looks like it's sort of just like a science fiction thing. But it's a it's a ho this is mainly a hotel, um, and at the, the top it's kind of shaped like a ship. And you can go to the top of this building and there's like a bar and a pool and all this kind of fancy stuff at the top there. And uh, and here's another one. This is also, these are all in Singapore. This is, they have beautiful gardens in Singapore. And this is a gazebo at night. And this one, I'll mention one other thing about this one. Not only is the lighting conditions exposed properly, but the, the, uh, comp the uh, composition. So you have several different vectors here, these lines of the sidewalk leading, and it's framed by these trees in the middle. So another thing you want to think about when you're taking photographs uh, take a little time to compose the shot properly, place things in the middle or have some sort of symmetrical balance. Makes for a more pleasing photo to the eye. So that's, uh, and these are some more from Singapore. I'll just scroll through these kind of quick. Uh, sometimes you can take some interesting pictures through glass. Um, this, <laughs> Singapore is also very, it's tropical, so it's very rainy frequently. So this is, this looks like night, but this is like about two o'clock in the afternoon. It gets real dark and very rainy. I took this through a bus window. So that's, you know, you, people often think I got to clean off the window and make it, you know, sometimes it's a more of a unique shot to uh, have sort of, so to speak, a filter. This is an interesting area. Well, this is more about street photography. I mentioned that earlier. This is more street photography. This is uh, during a Hindu festival. And it's um, very busy and very bright and um, and, and, and beautiful. You know, to, this is on a street. It's hard. To, it looks like it's inside, but this is literally on a city street. Yeah. So this uh, picture here. Now I'll move to something more nature landscape. This is in Sri Lanka. Uh, Sri Lanka, if you don't know, is an island nation off the coast of India. And this is an area. This is an area in their highlands. So Sri Lanka is also very tropical, and they have lowlands, which are a little more arid, and then they have tropical highlands and in between are the are the tea plantations um, and you can see over here some this is part of it these are tea tea leaves tea plants up through the highlands and it's just absolutely gorgeous uh, but it's a very difficult country to navigate another thing about travel I mean we're talking about photography but you know the one of the other things to consider is like where are you you know where are you traveling and is it you know how safe is it is the question sometimes, or, you know, can you get around? And this is, this was a pretty rugged uh, situation for me. I was, I actually had to take a train. I took a train from the capital region of Sri Lanka in the middle of the country uh, to through the cheap, through the lowlands, up to the tea plantations and into the highlands, which you're looking at right here. And uh, we, it's a five hour train try and there's no seats in the train. It's like kind of getting on a box car. And it was, you know, very difficult, let's put it that way. And um, so, but anyways, about halfway through the, the train ride, the uh, train stops 
and and there's there was a mudslide and we had to get off the train the, the tracks were wiped out by this mudslide so i had to get off the train in the middle of nowhere and then walk through the jungle land to this train station. it was just a crazy it was like something from a movie so the point i'm making is that you know so obviously we're talking about doing this in a very ideal and safe and you know comfortable environment so uh, sometimes you get into situations where a little more extreme but it afforded me to get to these highlands which were beautiful i stayed in a very kind of rustic rustic would be a overstatement kind of little motel um but uh this was kind of one of the views it was just beautiful just uh, hiking up these mountains so anyways uh sometimes you have to i guess the point of this picture is sometimes you have to go through a lot to get the picture that you really want uh appropriately oh yeah some more from yeah these are just some, some more from sri lanka here's a another thing we mentioned like people in place or animals like nature there were monkeys everywhere, and I mean, their monkeys were like squirrels. There, they were everywhere. These little kind of uh, recent monkeys just all over the place. This was interesting. This is a Buddhist temple built right into the caves of a mountain. So yeah, so that's Sri Lanka. I wanted to take some time to show you this picture here. This this is interesting here. So there's this picture here, right, of this tree. Um, so I saw this picture of this tree. Or I saw this tree, and this was in a um, this is also in Sri Lanka in this uh, nature preserve. And it looks like just a junky old dead tree in the swamp. It doesn't look like much. And I noticed that the sun was the sun was kind of breaking through. The, it was kind of a weird day weather wise. It was kind of cloudy and sunny and cloudy and sunny. So I had the driver take me around to the other side. And then I was able to snap this picture. It's the same tree. That's the, the, this tree is the same as this tree, just from a different angle. And I, I always show this this I always show these back to back so you can see that if you just if you're out traveling and you're looking around before you look through your camera, you have to kind of look around your entire environment and see, OK, what should I take a picture of and what are the lighting conditions? What would what might be? And there was there was no trick photography here. There's no fancy adjustments on the camera. It was me simply placing myself in a different position. And so I got around the other side of the tree where it was backlit. I got lucky with the sky kind of opening up here. And I took this picture of this tree, uh, which is, um, you know, it was, uh, you know, uh, an award winning photo for me. Um, and it was just merely, I mean, I saw this. I'm like, yeah, wait a minute. Let's see if we go around the other side. And then we got this. And, and I also want to mention, I guess, at this point, I don't really do any Photoshop. Um, once in a while, I might do a little color correction, but this is pretty much the exactly what I saw with my eye out there in Sri Lanka. Let's see. John, we had a question come through. What is the go to camera you use while traveling? Oh, OK, uh, well, you know, usually when I do this, uh, when I do this. Uh, this lecture live, uh, I mean, like in person, I have the I bring some equipment. I don't have any to show you with my hand here. But I used to use, well, of course, way back, I used to use film cameras. Then I went to DSLR full-size cameras. But those are still kind of heavy. To They're manageable, but they're still kind of heavy to have in a backpack, especially if you're hiking or going, or, you know, you're trying to walk through city streets and things of that nature. So for the last five years or so, I've been using, if, if you can write this down if you're not familiar, it's they are the mirrorless cameras. Mirrorless cameras are basically smaller versions of fancy cameras, depending on what one you get, of course. And they're more compact. They still allow for interchangeable lenses. So you can take the lens off, put a telephoto lens on. You can take that off and put a wide angle lens on or a prime lens, whatever you want to use. And they take, and um, I, I, don't, I can't see every picture here, but pretty much every picture you're seeing here, I'd say 75% of them are taken with a Olympus OMD mirrorless camera. And they're and I can put them in a backpack and it's not even a big backpack. I wish I had it. I don't have it with me here, but um, it's like a backpack. You'd see like somebody take for the school, like a kid would take the school, like that size backpack, even smaller. And it's light. And uh, like I, I had that the one from Sri Lanka, but I had it on my backpack and it wasn't laboring with it at all. And it's and it's also we can get other things about like city streets and things like that. You got to if you have a backpack on a city street, especially in any kind of big city anywhere in the world, you have to be careful, you know, with pickpocketers and things like that. So all these, all my camera bags, all the zips are, um, you know, inside. So they have to, I have to take it off to zip it open. So you, if I'm walking on the street with my back, I can't zip it open. So it's kind of secure in that regard. But anyways, the camera is 
there are, you know, Nikon makes mirrorless cameras, Panasonic makes mirrorless cameras. I just happen to have an Olympus version. So that's what I use. This photo is from Italy. Maybe some people have been to Venice. And uh, so this photo is, again, this is a photo that was taken at dusk. If you've ever been to Venice, to Venice, Venice is usually pretty warm in the day and then it kind of cools off at the night. And it has a different, a different, more romantic, if I dare say romantic atmosphere in the evening. And uh, so I was on a, I forget the name of the bridge, but obviously if you know Venice, it's a lot of, it's almost all canals. And there's these bridges that, you know, go over all the canals. And I was on a bridge and I saw the moon rising over these buildings. I'm like, oh, I've got to get this. And so I had to, you know, this again, the camera is on a tripod. So in order to get a lot of these photos that look nice at night, if you were to hand hold it, it just, it, it wouldn't come out the same way because first of all, you wouldn't get the right exposure and it would, you're, you're, you're naturally going to move a little bit with your hands. So if you put it on a tripod, it remains stable and it, and it, it doesn't get blurry and it, and you can expose it at any level you want. And this is pretty much. It's not really underexposed or overexposed. This is pretty much what it looked like. I, I know we've all seen like the moon rise a little bit prior to it being like nighttime, you know, and it's a pretty shot over the canal like that. And it was a busy bridge. The bridge, I mean, there were people bumping in. I mean, you know, it, was, it looks peaceful, but there it was a kind of a busy pedestrian bridge. So that's another big seller in this one um, of, of Venice. Let's see. These are some more shots of Italy. Uh, this is the uh, a region in uh, uh, Tuscany. This is also in Venice. This is in um, Assisi uh, in, in Italy as well. Again, this is one that I took by just, I'm talking about this one right here. This is one I took by just going up a hill. Everybody walks to the plaza and I'm like, there's, I, I looked with, I was down here and I looked, and I go, there's a hill up there. So I just went out of this plaza and went up the hill and sometimes it just takes finding a different location. This is more like architecture. So this is like a prison door, like in a um, like a dungeon area in Italy. And what I liked about this picture was there was so much light in the prison cell compared comparatively. So that's some shots from Italy. So Singapore, Yosemite. Oh, now this one, this one, oh, oh this is in uh, Bangkok, Thailand. And again, I, I'm showing you this picture so you can see uh, how to take shots at night because it's often a different perspective and it's, you know, beautiful light. It's, it's a, photography is really all about capturing light at the appropriate level. So this is a temple in uh, Bangkok and the temples are very busy in the daytime. Like any tourist attraction, there are people everywhere and it's very chaotic and crowded. But at night, the, the temples are, they still basically are open, but nobody really goes at night. So you might see a few people walking around. So I just went to this temple. I would already visit in the daytime. I'm like, wow, this is really interesting looking architecture and beautiful landscaping and everything. So I went back at night and I, I literally was sitting on the sidewalk. I'm take this picture. I put the tripod the, again. The camera's on a tripod, very low to the ground, and I and I just sat there waiting. I waited until the sky was this gradation from these sort of orangey pink to these blue purple. I just kind of waited there for about a half an hour. A few people, well, I have, I took maybe 30, 25 to 30 shots of this, of this building. A few of them there are people, and you have to kind of wait for people to get out of the way sometimes. But, um, but so that shot, you know, again, it, and it has some symmetry. You have the light here and the light here. You have the guard here and the guard here, and then the building in the middle, the trees on each side. So it's kind of a balanced image that way as well. So that's Bangkok. And, and of course, Bangkok has a lot. I mean, there's tons of things to I, I get every place I've been to always has unique and interesting things to take photographs of. And um, Bangkok was there was no shortage there. As you can see here, there's all kinds of interesting things. These temples, there's these beautiful like this is a this this it doesn't really do it justice. This temple here, this this is outside in the courtyard. This this marble floor of this uh, courtyard is so shiny, it reflects everything perfectly. I couldn't really get a photograph of it, but it, it really was amazing uh, exterior. And again, at night, beautiful how these light up at night so you can get the right exposure. 
Again, you can take close ups of things. People, you might want to, like when I'm doing displays, I often have close ups of things so people can, you know, you, you see things from far away, but you, we have a tendency to want to see something up close to get the texture, to get the details of things. So it's always good to kind of every once in a while walk up to something and take a close up shot to get people can see some, you know, micro details. This is interesting. Uh, in, in Bangkok, uh, so I'm sure a lot of people that are listening have uh, gone to like a farmer's market, you know, locally. So they have farmers markets in, in Thailand, except for most of them are on rivers. So the pe the farmers come up in their little boats like this, and then they have they display all their things, whatever they're displaying, and um, you can buy it. This lady actually is, she's a boat that makes salads. You can go up and order a, see, you can see people sitting here. You can order a salad. She puts it together with all this fresh stuff from her, you know, farm. And so, but they're all in boats. You can just go and buy any kind of fruit or vegetable from the boat and just like you would at a regular farmer's market, but you walk through all these different docks. So it's kind of a cool, uh, unique way to do a farmer's market. So this photo is in Australia and there are some wet there. Are, Australia has quite a variety of climates and this is an arid, very arid part. This is in Western Australia, the Western dunes kind of, this would be North of Perth. If you're familiar with Australia, it's the west coast of Australia, Perth, and then nor north of Perth, and a little inland. Um, and this is the, this is sometimes this sort of desolation is beautiful, like this really just it looks like you wouldn't want to wander off here, of course, but, you know. Uh, but it, just seeing it is is a beautiful nature and this windswept sand and the. I mean, sometimes I get lucky too because it's just a beautiful blue sky day. There wasn't a cloud anywhere, and the blue contrast contrasting with the white sands um, just makes a very it's a very aesthetically simple picture, but um, you know captures the beauty of the of that desert dunes. And here are some more from Australia, uh, different area. I was in Australia. I was in Australia, uh, so it was it was like April, mid April. So it's like their fall. So, you know, Southern hemisphere, the seasons are reversed. So it was their fall. And um, so it was interesting. It was weird to be there. Like, you know, it's, this is March, but it feels like October. It was just kind of weird, but um, I'll, I'll point out this picture here, this picture. Um, again, I, I don't recommend if you, I mean, I, I recommend that. Yes, you find the angle to take the picture you want, but I had to climb up. A lot of the stuff I do is more. A little more rugged, so I had to climb up. This is on the coast. This is the Indian Ocean. You're looking at the Indian Ocean uh, at sunset, and so the, there's a very rugged coastline. If anybody's been to like Northern California or Oregon coast, it's very similar to that. Those the wet the northwestern coast of our country uh, is similar to the west coast of Australia. It reminded me of that a lot, and so I had to climb up some rocks here and um, find a spot. And then I just kind of waited for the sun to break through at sunset and captured this, this photo. And then one other one from, I wanna mention because it's a different, this, this photo, there's lots of lighthouses along the coast. This is done with a fish-eyed lens. I'm not sure if you can notice this, but it's slightly, there's a sort of a curvature of the ground here and, the, and, the, and it's pushing the lighthouse forward uh, you know, at you. And it looks like everything's kind of curved around it. So this is done with a with a fish eye lens. It's a special lens you can put on your camera to really create um, a very very wide angle, which is so wide that it kind of has this curvature to it. So, so that's something you can throw in throw into your tool kit or equipment if you're into it. Okay, let's see what else we have here. Um, oh, this one real quick. Um, this one. These are these pinnacle rocks. There was a whole desert with these crazy, it's called Pinnacle Rock um, Park, I guess it was a, like a national park. And it was very hot and they had all these weird looking rocks sticking out of the ground like this. And um, it reminded me a little bit of the Southwest United States, um, you know, like parts of Utah or Arizona or New Mexico, a little bit like that. The only thing that you don't see here, which, uh, you know, it's kind of one of those behind the scenes things, uh, so I, you can drive through this area and I would drive through a little bit and I would get out of the car and I would walk around and take some pictures, but there were, it was every, every time you got out of the car, you were immediately met with all kinds of those black flies that would just 
they get they buzz around your hair and your ears and it was terrible there were so many obviously you don't see the flies in this picture but you know it's not always the best conditions to you, you're trying to take a picture and they're like in your eye and uh, it's awful anyway so that's uh australia australia is great minus the flies and uh this is in germany this is this is uh neuschwanstein i don't know if people have been in neuschwanstein neuschwanstein usually is photographed as a um if you've seen pictures of Neuschwanstein or been there, it, it, it's usually photographed as like a fairy tale castle, something you'd see in Disneyland. It's, it has these spires and it's colorful and it's like like a fairy tale kind of castle. But I happen to be there on a very obviously, as this picture depicts, a gloomy, foggy day and it took on a different atmosphere. It was like more medieval and more foreboding and kind of dark, right? And so I love the way the uh, fog was rolling off the hills here into the into the area of the castle and everything was everything is muted it almost looks like a black and white it's not quite black and white but it almost looks that way because of the, just the grays and i just felt that the atmosphere matched if, and, and, and again it was this angle if you walk around the front of the castle it looks a little more fairy tale this is a different angle with just the grays in this and the architecture of the castle here so so sometimes you just always have to be a sunny beautiful day as soon as you can get some really interesting photography on more overcast days and and by the way an overcast day it's easier to control it's the lighting is more even it's it, clouds clouds act as a diffuser to the sunlight so it makes even light and that's sometimes easier to work with than a sunny day where you're trying to get out of shadows or you know harsh light um, let's see okay any questions let me make a take a moment see if anybody has any questions and the questions about places or tips. Um, so there is one about, can you talk about getting the exposure just right? Mm -hmm. Yes, so. Um, so to get the exposure, right? You usually if it's a nighttime shot, like, let's say that 1 from Bangkok of the of the um, of the temple. So you you have to get the exposure right and leave the shutter open. I don't want to get too technical here, but you leave the shutter open. So you normally on a camera you push the button, it goes, which means the shutter opens and closes. That that sound, you know, in an old in a regular old camera, that's literally the shutter opening and closing. Just kind of makes that sound effect now. But it, the shutter opens and closes. So if you can picture a door, or a, maybe a window is a better analogy. So a window is closed. You push the button. The window opens. And the light comes through and the window closes. Right? That's how a normal picture is taken. So if it's very dark, you have to adjust the shutter so it stays open longer. So now if it's night, I I I, I push the button, it goes and the window opens, and then it stays open longer. And because it stays open longer, more light can has a chance to get through and then eventually closes. So normally a shutter is opening and closing in milliseconds, but at night you might open it up for like a second. It goes or even three seconds like that. And then that allows more light in. So on your camera, you'll see that as a shutter speed. It'll say, if you have a camera that can adjust, it'll say shutter. And you can usually adjust it to any fraction of a second to, you know, if you're doing night photography, even like 10, 20, 30 seconds, if it's like stars and things like that. Normally, like the shot you saw of Bangkok, I mean, the, the shutter was probably open maybe three seconds, not a super long time. Because like, the more it's open, the more it, it, it will overexpose. So to get those exposures for night, you have to really play with the shutter. Uh, you can also open the aperture, which is the the opening, which allows light in as well. Those two kind of go hand in hand. But I would recommend, without making it sound too confusing, just work with the shutter um, and, and see what happens. And I should also mention, as far as cameras are concerned, you know, you're going to have a general choice to be on automatic or manual. If you put it on automatic, the camera will make the adjustments for you, but it, it, the camera thinks that you just want the picture to look the best. And it's gonna take a picture probably, like if it's a night shot, it probably will look good like in your viewfinder, but when you get it home or you wanna enlarge it or you wanna make it an eight by 10 or something or even bigger for a display, it'll probably it won't look as good. It'll be a little blurry and it'll be, it'll be um, a little grainy. And that's because the camera is just making adjustments that are, you know, like ISO adjustments, technical adjustments, not really the l actual light. It's, I don't, it's, it's too technical to get into it exactly, but I would just say 
if you're if you want to have good exposure at night, just play with the shutter. You'll see if you'll you should if you have a camera that you can adjust the shutter, you'll see different adjustments for the shutter. And also, as I mentioned earlier, you, you're going to need a tripod, um, or at least something that you. I have a little tiny tripod like this big. That's the three little legs. It's like this big, and I put it in a bag, and I can at least put it on a chair or on a sidewalk or on a bench. I also carry a longer one so I can put it full size. Um, but if you if you have in mind of taking some shots at night, you will need some kind of little tripod to stabilize the camera. Otherwise, people always think I can still hand hold it without, and it, it's just not gonna. It won't work. It, it'll it'll be blurry when you start looking at it closely. So shutter speed and, and tripod are the best way to get those exposures correct. Okay, thanks, John. Mm -hmm. uh, next question that came through is, do you feel the art of photography is being diminished by the advancement of cameras? Well, no, I don't. I, I, I mean, I know, I know what you're, I think I know what you're saying. Like, okay, so the camera can do all this work. The camera can make all this, it's so automated. Like what skill does the photographer have? What artistic um, input does the photographer have? I, I get the question because of the functions of the camera. Uh, but if, again, if you kind of sidestep that and just use the camera manually and, and make your own adjustments, that, that, you know, precludes the camera making the choices for you. So that's one. And then again, no matter what kind of camera you're using, uh, no matter how advanced the camera is, you still have to do the things I've been mentioning, like pick your angle, uh, find your spot, um, me you know, measure the light just with your own eyes. You have to kind of see the composition. Um, one of the things I mentioned to people as far as travel photography is concerned is I either see people like, to either not taking enough pictures or taking way too many pictures. There's usually kind of those two extremes. I've been on trips with people. We, another thing we, that I've done previously is uh, was part of the international club at the college. So we'd take students on these trips to you know England or Europe or some other place, and these students they they have their they have their phone. They, this is what they do. They're like this all the time. Click click click, and I'm like, you. You know, so the first tip about photography is to take less pictures and enjoy the reality of what you're experiencing. That's like the first thing, really. Um, and then, but then also be, as a photographer, be mindful of what you're seeing as you're walking around, like this castle you're seeing. I'm, I'm walking, I'm in the exterior, I'm just walking around, I'm enjoying the, the reality of it. But I'm also looking around like, wow, look at the, look at those clouds and fog coming in. Look at the, you know, and, I, and then, I, then I take a picture. I don't, I, people that have traveled with me, they, they think you don't, you don't take as many pictures as I thought you'd be taking, you know? Uh, but then when I find a spot, then I might sit there for a good 15 minutes to get the shot I want. So again, it's a great question about the art of photography. I think a lot of people do rely too much on the camera and it, and it subtracts a little bit from the artistry. Uh, but if you can use that camera as a tool and, and then do those other things like composition and lighting just on, on your own perspective, then the, the artistry comes back in. All right. Let me go to the next photo here. Let's see what we got. Oh, this is more from Germany. This is a, these are two with fisheye lenses again. You can see like this is at the top of a building. You can see look at the look at the horizon line. See this horizon line is curved. That tells you it's a it's a very warp. It's a fisheye lens which warps the 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 um, curvature. Same with this one. This is the uh, Black Forest in Germany with this old trestle. Oh, this is new. Uh, not this is um. Oh, I forget the name. Of, I've, I've lost the. Uh, let's see what is the name of this. I forget the name of this palace here. But um, this is another one with symmetry. You can see the reflection. Uh, so sometimes I just this is again. I'm gonna just again. So many of these photos are just finding the spot. So we were we were dropped off like over here on a bus. And this was one of this is a tour I took with some students. And so we walked through this castle or this palace. It's a palace, not a castle. And you know, we walked through this, and there's a courtyard on the other side of this. Then we came out these doors here, and I'm like, there's a really beautiful like pond here. So I just took a walk all the way around this pond to this other side and took this photo. I so sometimes you just have to look around and see what is the best vantage point to get the shot that you want. They were doing some construction, so it wasn't as Pretty as I would have liked, but still, uh, composure, uh, composition-wise, what I wanted. 
Okay, let's see. This is uh, this is a um, this is an in Indonesia. Indonesia are, is a, all islands. So this is an island. This is an inland lagoon. Indonesia has so many different kinds of climates as well, mostly tropical. But um, this is a desert area, and um, this beautiful blue. No Photoshop here. Blue is that's as blue as the water literally was. I had to pay. Uh, th th there's these little tiny wooden docks that that extend off these little lakes, and I and I and they're, and they're just these rickety little docks. So I walked out on the end of the dock and I took this photo, right? I, just at the end of this dock, I'm, I'm kneeling down and I took this photo, and then I walked back off the dock and there was a man, like an old man, sitting like in a little chair at the end of the dock, and he had his hand out for money and he's saying money, money, you know. And I'm like, oh, okay, money. What? What is the money for? What? And he and he and he said, I basically, but broken English, he explained that he owns the dock. And it was just this little, ten foot, rickety wood planks. I said, oh, okay. Uh, how much to go on? You know, because I already went on the dock. How much? And in American money, he was asking for ten cents. So I said, oh, okay. You know, and I, I think I gave him like a dollar. I mean, like coins, just Indonesian currency, a dollar, and he was. You know, very thankful for the dock rental, I guess. <laughs> more from Indonesia. Again, more temples, uh, nighttime shots. This is a sunrise shot. This is the sort of the South China Sea in Indonesia. This is an interesting shot of, we mentioned like, like architecture or things. This is a temple. This is the called a 500 Lohan temple. And all of these statues are all different. They're all making different faces and doing different things. And this isn't a courtyard. There's 500 of them. And when you walk, I'm telling you, when you walk out this courtyard to the back part here, it's a little, it's a little off put. Like the first thing you think of is this, like, because they're life size, like real people are just sitting there. And then you can walk around them. And, and I, I have close to this, but they all have, they're all doing something different. All these statues. It's pretty, pretty wild. Again, this is exposure. Um, uh, you know, sunrise, sunset, you get the right sky and everything. So this is, uh, this is in Japan. Um, Japan has uh, lots of beautiful, especially in Kyoto, beautiful Buddhist temples and Zen gardens. They're, they would be exactly as you would imagine, very peaceful, very beautiful. Beautiful just in nature, but beautifully landscaped and taken care of and the many, many photo opportunities and, and the, it's, it's very quiet. Even if it's crowded, it just has a quiet feel. It's just uh, if you ever get a chance to go to Japan, I can't recommend going to any of these um, kinds of they're, they're, you, you're not. There's no shortage of them there's everywhere. There's, I mean, I think in Kyoto alone, there's like 150, you know, so you have no problem finding them. So anyways, I was, I was, I, I like these little archways. There's a name for these archways. I forget the actual name, but there's a name for these archways they are everywhere, different colors. And it led to a little uh, bridge in another little part. So some, so see this, this sign up here at the top of this thing. So I, I asked someone, I said, what is this? What is this sign? I don't know the, how to read this. So like, what is, what is that saying? That sign? And they said, the sign says, um, the way to prosperity is through tranquility. And I'm like, I said, wow, that's, you know, it's a nice thing, to, nice way to think about things. So I said, what does this sign mean? And they said, this sign says coffee and tea over here. <laughs> so, you know, it's, you know, oh, here's your coffee and tea, but this is the prosperity through tranquility is the uh, way across the bridge there. But again, very beautiful areas. Sometimes we mentioned the art artistry of the photography or, you know, the skill of the photographer. Sometimes it's just finding the right spot. I mean, the, the nature is doing all the work here. Again, more in Kyoto. Um, again, sometimes, you, a, as I mentioned earlier, sometimes a close-up can offer a different perspective. You know, you change the focal length so the background's blurry and the foreground's in focus. A little different approach, you know. Uh, one of the days I was in Kyoto, it rained and rained, and I was like, I can't even get out there. Then I went out after the rain, and the rain is a, sometimes can be a blessing because everything is then shiny. See how the sidewalks are all shiny. Um, you notice this, I don't know, as a little footnote, you notice this in like car commercials or in movies, 
they will spray the streets to make everything look shinier when they're shooting on streets. So it's really a pretty look. Again, more gar this is a bamboo forest um, in in uh, north uh, uh, north part of like sort of between Nara and uh, Kyoto in Japan. Let's see. Uh, let's go to the United States. This is uh, this if, again. This is a uh, Yosemite, but not the valley. This is north. This is Tulum Meadows in North Yosemite. Maybe some of you have been to Yosemite, like the valley, like the 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 famous part, like you know, everybody sees the iconic imagery, um, which is absolutely gorgeous. But it's usually quite crowded. I mean, a lot of the parks get crowded. Certainly in the summertime, they're oh, I, I dare say overcrowded. But but in North Yosemite. So I went to Yosemite several times. But the time I this this particular photos were in like end like end of May, so it was starting to get pretty crowded in the valley. We went up to North Yosemite in this Tule Meadows, like the middle of the day. There was I might have I might have seen ten people, and you can see in this picture there's nobody there's no people around. It's enough. So I've, like a travel tip: if you're going to Yosemite, see if you can work in North Yosemite. It's about it's still a it's huge, right? So it's still about a two and a half hour drive from the valley up north you go around mountains but but it's very it's very beautiful and not crowded and really you can you know kind of breathe up here again this is another one with composition i wanted to frame the river between these trees with the mountain so the framing the eyes lead along the river and then you have the framing of the trees here and the mountain in in this sort of third of the frame here This is more from California. You saw this one earlier. This is a, uh, this one is, a, I don't know if people have heard of this. This is a ghost town in on the border of California and Nevada. It's Bodie. It's, a, it's an actual state park. It's, they call it, a, it's preserved. It's called arrested, it's called arrested decay, which means they preserve it in the state that it was left. They don't touch anything. So you can look through the windows and there's like, there's like stuff on the stove, the, the classroom has, like the schoolhouse has writing on the chalkboard. There's papers. They just leave it exactly how it was left, and it's and it's frankly pretty spooky. <laughs> it's a ghost town, and it's it's kind of you walk around. It's like they just kind of left, and there's no one here. And it, the wind the wind whistles through this. It's really it's a cool place to go. Again, this is another one with framing using trees. Another thing to think about when you're composition: find something to frame. These are called frames within frames. So you have the frame of the shot. But then you, I use these trees here and here to frame this mountain here. Paris. So um, again, with Paris, uh, city of lights. So a lot of night photography. This was a little bit fog coming in, so I captured. I was able to get the fog going across. Um, I forget the name. I, I don't have all this written down right in front of me. I, I, I don't. I forget the name of this bridge. A famous bridge in um, Paris uh, for those that are maybe a fans of Adele, the famous singer Adele did her music video on this bridge. Um, so anyways, uh, capturing Paris, different elements of Paris. I mean, the, Eiffel, the another thing I should mention is that, you know, you're gonna go to places where there's these iconic things like the Eiffel Tower, and you can only take so many pictures of the Eiffel Tower, and then you go, okay, I've seen it, like I get it, right? So you, you, you. So this one again, I like. You're probably noticing I like dusk shots. It's a nice time to take photos. And so um, this is Versailles and Notre Dame. Different photos there. Here's uh, this is Tokyo. Tokyo is exactly what you see here. An absolute visual overstimulation. This picture here is several composites. So it's 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 you're seeing like three photos put together, um, but it's it's. It's an accurate description visually of what I felt like in downtown. Well, I wouldn't even say downtown um, Tokyo. It's just like massive downtown everywhere. It's really not a downtown, hard to say. This is a, a this is people think this is the Eiffel Tower. It's not, this is in Tokyo. Um, the beautiful gardens in Tokyo. Uh, this is a, this intersection is very famous because in, in Tokyo, um, so like the streets, you know, like in, in the United States, like, you know, it, when one road is going, then the people cross the other way. And then that there's a stoplight and then that people go, they cross that way, the traffic goes the other way. In Tokyo, 
they don't, there's no crossing the streets. And then eventually this, the, then all streets stop and then everybody crosses at once. So, and this is, uh, in, uh, um, Shibuya crossing is very famous. Like any one point of crossing there's usually about a thousand people crossing. Like every time people cross the street, this is nothing. There's no festival. There's, this is just like people crossing the street regular in the daytime. So, and so, and, and it kind of shows Kyoto, or uh, not Kyoto, but Tokyo is very, very busy and very uh, crowded. So not, it's, a, it's a lot different than other parts of Japan, obviously. I don't know. I just want to show some other ones that are different conditions. I don't know if anybody here does any kind of, um, you know, um, winter sports, but skiing, skiing. Uh, so I do some snowboarding and some skiing. And uh, again, it's you're going to have different lighting conditions, which are very bright. You have, if it's a sunny day and you have bright white snow, you can imagine how bright it's kind of like a beach. Beaches are similar, like it's water and sunlight. It's very, very bright. And then, of course, you have to, since it's all white, you have to figure out what would be good com composure. So I always, I like to take photos that are uphill very often. So I'll snowboard down or ski down a little bit and then stop and look back uphill um, or cross hill instead of just down. So that offers some interesting ones. And these are different photos of different ski areas. Again, you can do close ups, which add a little variation to displaying things. Um, this one is, this one is one of my biggest, this photo is one of my biggest sellers. Uh, and this is a, uh, this is in, um, Tremblant. It's, uh, uh north, north of Montreal in, in Quebec and, uh, a nice little, uh, forest with variation in the color of the trees and the bark. Um, this is, this one here is the Swiss, uh, in the Alps. This is the Alps. Just a. I don't know if you can see this right here. These little black dots here are, are the is the gondola going up to the top. We were gonna. This was in, this was in like uh, June, so this the, you can see it's green at this part of it, and and at the top was in a snowstorm. So we went up on the gondola. We were gonna hike down, me and my friend, but we're they're like, no, there's no hiking down there. You gotta take the gondola down, then get off, and then hike the rest of the way down. This this is if anybody's been to Vermont, this is in Stowe, Vermont. Um, looking uh, at the beautiful again, it, a lot of this is nature, right? So nature is so beautiful in any time of the season. The the way the snow is covering the trees and the blues and the, it's just a beautiful nature offers so many great photographic opportunities, even uh, you know in different seasons. So I wanted to, I wanted to stress that you know don't you know some people put the camera away in the winter. It's still still great photography, you know. Uh, this is in Malaysia. Just some quick shots of some places in Malaysia. Um, this I, I usually show these two because it's the same. It's the same place, but one's at night and one's in the day. So like this is this is the day, okay. And this is a, this is um, North. Mal this is an, this is actually Langkawi, which is an island off the coast of Malaysia. And I'm looking basically north, sort of northwest towards um, Thailand, and that's day. And then this is the same, basically the same thing at night. So it shows you, you can get, you know, just because you take one picture, you might want to go back to that location a different time to get a different feel. Uh, these are some various ones from just Europe here. Uh, this is Spain. This one I did a little, this one's a little different. I usually show it's a little different tilt focus. So there's a special effect you can go called tilt focus which focuses usually like depth of field, like what's in focus is two feet away, what's in focus is 20 feet away or in, or 100 yards away, whatever. This is like what area of the frame is in focus. So you tilt, you can either do it with an apparatus on the camera or in Photoshop and you tilt it to be an area and everything else is out of focus. This is called Lover's Lake in Belgium. Um, and I guess the story is that uh, two lovers uh, met here, fell in love, and, and then somehow they were taken away from each other. Circumstantially, they had to separate. And they said, we will, we will meet back at Lover's Lake in five years to reconvene our romance. And, and, um, and then one of them showed up and the other one didn't. Lover's Lake. This one is in the uh, Swiss Alps. This is an abbey. 
in the Swiss Alps. I we had just got done. It was the same day with that mountain with the snowstorm on the top. It was the same day I did that photo. Uh, we had gotten back. I we just sat down. My friend and I just sat down and to have a beer at the, our hotel was basically right across the street from here. And we sat down, poured a beer, and we're ready to just relax for the evening. And then this light went on. Just one solitary light went on in this place. I'm like, ooh, that's a let me go get my stuff. And I went back and I got my camera stuff and took the photo of this of this. Uh, yeah, more castles from around. Um, more just as some random ones here, some various ones, just to show you some color variations. This is um in, this is Aspen. In like Snowmass, Aspen, Colorado, and these are the maroon bells. Look at so you have these colors. So you have blue, kind of maroon, reddish, and then greens. So it allows you to have, you know, gradation of colors, which offers some interesting things. So you can look. Sometimes you just look around for interesting colors to take shots of. Sometimes it's net, the landscapes themselves offer really unique geological, like the Pinnacle Rocks in Australia. These are. Um, these are temple rocks in in um, um, and this is New Mexico, in New Mexico, near near like Santa Fe. Uh, this is in Mexico. This is the uh, Chicha Inza uh, Itza uh, um, ruins, the uh, Mayan ruins. This is uh, again um, sunset photos are pretty. I don't take a lot of actual sunset actually. I like the time of day after the sun sets, but um, um, Key West. Oh, and then um, I always I always kind of show this one. This is, uh, you know, I do all these. So we're all around the world traveling from Europe to Asia to Australia, North America. And then this is my backyard. So we kind of come full circle to a macro shot. I, I just put the camera down in the grass and then this it's about a four inch, about a four inch focal length. So whatever's four inches away from the cameras in focus, everything else is out of focus. So we kind of, it's always nice to come back home, I guess is the way to, to kind of bring it full circle. So yes, yeah, so that's that's a kind of a highlights there. Um, I'd be happy to, uh, let me get to the top here. There we go. Um, to answer more of your questions or explain things more, if you have a question. Yes, there's quite a few questions, John. Thank you for taking us on that trip. Yes, you're welcome. So this question is, what places took you by surprise and that your expectations were blown away in a good way? Uh, my expectations in a good I would say um, uh, probably Kyoto, Japan, because my I had expectations that there would be like temples there, but I did not think they'd be as beautiful and as I didn't think they'd have as a big effect on me. I thought, oh, I'll go to the temple, I'll walk through the gardens, I'll enjoy the beauty, and I'll take some pictures. Like that's you know, but when I got on the grounds, I a feeling definitely it, there's definitely an atmospheric, philosophical feeling that kind of it's kind of like going into a church, even if you're not religious, or you in a church, kind of feel like a like a sense. Uh, it, it was like that, and that I did not expect, and that was a positive. I, I couldn't get enough of it then. I was going to every possible like Zen garden and Buddhist temple I could find, right? So that would be one. And then I, the other one would have been, um, as I was mentioning earlier, North Yosemite was, I thought, let's just go there and see what it's like. It's on the, you know, and it was, it, you know, as beautiful as the valley and not as crowded. Those are the two places that off the top of my head exceeded my expectations. Oh, thanks. For oh, and I'll say one other, one other thing, just for if you haven't, um, Paris is one of those places that that meets your expectations. Like, so Paris is advertised as this romantic city of light thing. And when I, I've been there four times and every time it's like this place is exactly as advertised. Some places you go and you're like, it's not quite as good as you think or the advertise. It's like, this is nice, but but Paris it meets the expectations of how it's advertised. All right, good to know. Thanks for the commercial, John. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, this next question is, do you have any thoughts on the use of drones in landscape photography? Yes, um, I I have a drone. Um, I haven't I haven't taken it on any trips because there's lots of rules and regulations about drone photography, especially like at national parks. 
uh, certainly in cities and things like that, you can't just start flying your drone, you know, willy nilly. So I haven't really taken it many places. Um, I've tried it locally, like, you know, here in Western New York at some of the county parks, um, just taking it, put it up and taking some pictures. I love, I love the way it looks, but I, I, I haven't really found a way to use it where I would take something artistic. It's definitely aerial photography, which is kind of a cool perspective, but I haven't really used it enough to find a way to use it artistically. Okay, thank you. Uh, someone's wondering, were you allowed to go inside that castle in Germany that you took the picture outside of? Oh yeah, yeah, that's Neuschwanstein. If you wanna write that down, it's a, it's a weird, crazy spelling, but it's called Neuschwanstein. And uh, it's in it's in Germany, southern Germany. It's in Bavaria, and it's a gorgeous castle. Um, it's and you and yes, you go inside and they have a tour and you can see the rooms and um, they of course like a lot of things they give you the history. Um, you know, I guess some king made it for his wife because she wanted this. You know, so um, yes, you can get definitely go inside and get a tour. Thank you. Just a couple more questions here. I know we're winding down. Mm -hmm. uh, this person is wondering if you can talk about how you make that background blurry for the focusing. Uh, let's see. You mean, let's see, like something like, um, let's this one, this one, I'll show you real quick here. Uh, so like something like this maybe, right? So this is th there's no there's no real trick it's just working with your working with your focal length and the focal length is the you know your ring when you're adjusting i wish i had the camera um you'll see on the there are numbers on the ring which are basically how far like feet how far you are from the subject that you want to get in focus so for this photo i moved the ring until it says maybe one i think i was maybe like a foot away from these tree branches and then I, I keep it there. And, it, and basically what I'm telling the camera is focus on those tree branches and then nothing else. Anything past, anything behind the tree branches is out of focus. So to get those kinds of shots, you have to kind of move your, fo your focal ring to the right length. Um, sometimes on a camera, like we were mentioning that it's automated, if you can't find a focal ring or your camera doesn't have the ability to do it manually, you can point the camera at it and like touch it and it'll focus on that thing. You can do that like on the, like on a, you know, like a, uh, I, uh, your iPhone or your Google Pixel or any kind of phone that has a camera, you can usually do something like that. Again, it allows the, it, allow, it allows for a shorter focal length and, it, and the macro details allow for, because you can only look at so many landscapes that are far away, then you want some detail too. So that's how you do it. All right, thanks, John. I'm just seeing one more question and one comment. So the question is, are there specific things you research about a culture before you visit? Oh, yes. Well, so yes, absolutely. So maybe it was, maybe it was mentioned in the, in the introduction. So I'm a professor as well. And uh, I usually, my I don't teach, by the way, I should kind of clarify this. I don't, I'm a professor in rhetoric and social science. I don't teach photography. But I do teach classes in communication and in symbolism and things of that nature. And one of the things we do is cross-cultural communication. And so when I go to some place, I do I do several things to sort of help me in uh, you know um, imbibe the culture. One is I learn about ten phrases. So whenever I go to like Japan or Sri Lanka or any of these countries, Germany, I try to learn at least ten phrases like please, thank you, excuse me. I would like, where is, like, just so I can get around and ask questions. And usually, and this is pretty fair to say, I hope, almost every place I've gone, at least somebody, you'll find someone that can speak English. It, most, most countries around the world, English is like a requirement as a second language. So you're usually going to find people that can speak English or know enough to converse with. Um, I, 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 we don't have time, but I got plenty of funny stories about not knowing the language or 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 saying the wrong word and people going to like it <laughs> right so um uh I, i'll say one real quick the, the, i was doing i was in japan and i and i learned the word for please so every place i was going i was saying this word please for, uh, please can i have coffee please can i get the taxi please can you show me i was saying please because i want you know be polite right and so every time i was saying please people were kind of giving me this weird look like 
okay, yeah, you know, here's your coffee. Like, you know, and I'm like, damn, I think I'm saying, I think I'm saying this wrong. So I went back to the hotel and I'm looking it up and I'm look, I'm like I'm doing like the voice thing. And I'm like, I'm saying it exactly right. What am I doing wrong here? So I kept saying it again for like another day or two. And it wasn't like I was offending people, but I was giving some strange looks, right? So finally I was at a coffee shop and the young lady briefly spoke in English because obviously she knew I was Western, not Asian. And, she, and, and, and so she spoke English. So I said, oh, this would be someone I could ask about. So I asked her, I said, am I, am I saying please correctly? And she said, not exactly. I, I, was basically, I was saying please, but I was using a version of please that was very archaic and old. And I was using the version of please that a that a servant would use to beg their master for something. So like basically I was walking around going, please, I beg to have the uh, that's what I was doing, like at a coffee shop or where's the and people are like, yeah, okay, here's your coffee. You know, <laughs> so so anyways, I, so yes, I try to learn languages, I try to know um, any kind of customs, I try to be respectful of any religion. Like I've gone into plenty, plenty of places where like I'd have to wear something different or cover up. And so just to be respectful and try to, you know, tr give an effort to, to kind of uh, adhere to the customs and people will appreciate that. And it goes a long way. And I, I like, I try to speak French. I know a little more French and I'm in, in Paris or in France and they know I can't, I'm not, I'm not speaking it well. So they see the effort and then they'll start speaking English. So usually that's the case. Okay, thanks, John. Mm -hmm. um, so we have this comment here. It's so much fun to see the world that I could never see if he hadn't taken the pictures. Thanks. Oh, yeah. Well, that's another thing, too. You know, that's why we I try to get these up in, uh, you know, galleries or little shows here and there so people can kind of. My mother says the same thing. My mother's, she's kind of afraid to travel. So she's not going to go really anywhere, let alone around the world. So she loves to see the photos and uh, sort of vicariously experience it. So that that's a nice uh, feature of it. Yes. Uh, we have thank you. Enjoyed traveling with you. Where can we buy your pictures? Uh, the pictures? Well, you can you can email me directly. Uh, I, I don't know uh, what how the contact information is uh, at, at your end there, Katie, but the, the, you can send my email that you have the my email from school Maharrigan at ECC edu email. Um, you can also uh, type in my name, uh, John Harrigan images. So if you, if you do a Google search and say, John Harrigan images, like all 1 thing, uh, you will get my website um, and you can buy photos on my website, but sometimes it's easier just to email me. I might have them and it's different, you know, that way too. So either way, going through the website or just email me directly. Um, if there's something you like, or you want to see other photos. Thank you, John. And then the last thing I'm seeing is great presentation. So interesting. So thank you so much for this today. Well, you're very welcome. I always enjoy uh, sharing the photos. Yes. It was wonderful. And everyone who's on, thank you so much. Hope everyone enjoys the rest of their day. And John, I'll connect with you offline. So take okay. care.